Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to my session on a tour of Matt Bartlett. I'll be taking you through uh, several slides, uh, several graph plots made with Matt Bartlett. Um, I'll start with some simple charts like line charts and um, bar charts and then move on to fun stuff like um, XK series study blocks. Uh, along the way, I'll also share a couple of stories where Matt Bartlett made a difference in my personal life and professional life. Before we get started, let me introduce myself. I am uh, Susan Pal. I'm a security architect at Walmart Labs. I develop uh, services in Go and Python. In my free time, I also work on a couple of my open source projects. Those are the links to my open source projects on GitHub. Um, and I've specified the links to my Twitter profile, GitHub profile, and my blog. Once this talk is over, I'll be sharing the slide deck on my Twitter in case you want to take a look at it. So let's get started with uh, Matt Proclip now. Uh, Matt Proclip, as you might be aware, is, a, is an extremely popular plotting lab <coughs> in Python. Um, it can be installed using the pip command. I usually create a virtual Python environment and then install uh, the, the library in the virtual Python environment. Uh, once it is installed, it is quite easy to test it out. Um, just launch the Python interpreter, uh, import matplotlib.pyplot as PMT. That's just a very popular convention uh, that is used in the matplotlib community. Then call the plot function, give it a list of numbers to plot, and finally call the show function. As soon as, soon as you execute the show function, something like this should pop up on your desktop and this shows that matplotlib is working fine. Um, in this particular plot, it is, it is one dimensional list that I've given, which is not, which is uh, unusual. Usually we plot uh, uh, two dimensional plots or three dimensional plots and so on. Uh, in this, um, what matplotlib has done, has taken this bunch of numbers and plotted them <coughs> against their indices. For example, this two, is at index 0, so if you look at x equal to 0, you have y equal to 2. So we'll stick with this plot for a while. Um, um, one theme I'll be following in this presentation is take a plot and keep customizing it until it looks good. Um, so for example, uh, the first thing I want to do is save this plot as an image file. And um, uh, saving, saving a plot as an image file <coughs> allows us to use this file in, say, uh, web articles or blog posts or documentation, um, the way we save a plot to a file is using the save pick function call. We specify the file name as an argument. Uh, we need to be careful about the DPI setting though, dots per inch. By default, matplotlib uses a DPI of uh, 100 dots per inches, dots per inch, and um, 100 DPI is not too bad, but it is not great either. To show you what I mean, I'll, I'll take this two, this tick label two that you see along the y-axis and blow it up on the next slide and show you what it looks like under the different DPI settings. So if you look at 100 DPI, the two is quite blurred, right? It does look blurred. With a DPI 300, it's much smoother. With the, and as you increase the DPI, the plot keeps getting smoother and smoother. Uh, although the file size increases. So in, in practice I found that with a DPI of 300, you get a good compromise between the file size and the quality. So I, I usually go for a DPI of 300 when I'm saving plots to image files. To save a plot with a DPI of 300, we need to use this additional keyword argument called DPI with a value of 300 while calling the uh, save fig function call. Apart from customizing the DPI, another thing I like to customize is the default uh, bounding box. So if you see this bounding box, it is quite large compared to the, to the actual area covered by the plot. Uh, this could be a problem if you are trying to share a plot like this on, in a web page where there are a lot of text paragraphs, for example. Because uh, each, uh, if you know HTML and CSS, you know that um, each text paragraph inter introduces its own margin above and below itself. And if there's a lot of padding around an image like this, that 
creates a lot of vertical space in, in the web page when you put an image like this between text paragraphs. So to get rid of these, this additional white space, I like to compute a title bounding box so that most of this white space is gone and it is more suitable to be included in a, a web page which has text paragraphs. I do that using the bbox underscore inches keyword argument uh, with a value of type. This computes a much tighter bounding box like this. Okay, so um, we'll stick with this plot for a while. We'll keep improving this. Uh, in this slide, I'm uh, using the x label and y label function calls to specify the labels along the x axis and y axis. Yeah. Um, so now I want to make each number that I have shown on, the, on, the, on this plot uh, in a more prominent way by using circle markers. The way we do it is using this extra argument called the format string. Uh, this format string has two letters, O and hyphen. The O stands for the circle markers. So now you see each numbers are visible quite prominently using the circle markers. The hyphen is called the solid line. The solid line was default anyway, um, but if you're going to override the default setting and um, try to customize it ourselves, we need to keep, put this hyphen back if you want to see the solid line. If you just put the, the letter O, we'll only see circle markers. The solid line will not appear. So since I want both of them, I've got O followed by hyphen. And now I'm trying to get rid of the fractional tick labels. So I'll show you the previous slide once more. So if you see this, there are fractional tick labels here, which is not useful in this particular plot because this is a plot of numbers versus their indices. So if I want to get rid of these, I can make use of this x ticks and y ticks function calls. Uh, I, I call x ticks with a list of five integers, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, and that's what we see appearing on the x-axis. And similarly for the y-axis with the y ticks function call. Uh, let me spend a little time with the format string. So we saw this format string here, O hyphen. So what does it look like? The syntax is composed of three parts, uh, the marker shape, the line style, and the color. The, um, okay, so let us take an, let us see an example. There is O hyphen K, that's an example, um, where O stands for the circle marker, hyphen for solid mm -hmm. line, K for black color. And there are many other uh, color abbreviations uh, supported, for example, R for red, uh, G for green, and so on. And uh, colors itself is a huge topic, which I will not be covering in this particular uh, presentation. Um, but there are many different ways to specify colors in Matplotlib. Uh, this is one of the simplest ones that I'm showing you on the slide. And of course, we have seen how to use uh, the format string in a previous slide. Let me show you a few more marker shapes. If we use dot as a format string, it shows us point markers. O for circle marker, we have seen this already. Lowercase b for triangle down marker. S for square marker. And this is the whole preference uh, of markers to choose from. I think there are 25 of them on this particular uh, screenshot. There are only four line styles. So I'll show you all four of them. Hyphen for solid line, we have seen this already double hyphen for dashed line, hyphen and dot for dashed dot line style, and colon for dotted line style. This is the reference for all four line styles. Okay, so now let us move on to a new <coughs> type of plot. This is a bar chart. It's, uh, in this bar chart, I'm trying to show the number of tigers in four Indian states. It's really simple to draw bar charts using Matplotlib. So we have this bar function called here. We specify these categorical values as the x-axis coordinates and uh, the list of the, the height of each bar as the y-axis coordinates. And once we make this function call, we get an output like this. Now I'll try to improve this plot a little bit. Uh, one thing I want to show is the is a legend here, which will tell us that this is a uh, these bar charts represent the number of tigers. So to do that, we need to make two function calls. So this is the legend that I was going for. 
the, the first thing we need to do is specify a label like this uh, while, plot, while using our plotting function and then we need to call the legend function call. So this legend function call picks all the labels that have been defined for various plots and puts them together into a legend box like this. Okay, so uh, let me improve this further. The next thing I want to show is the number of tigers on each bar column here. For example, if I were to look at, look at this graph on its own, I should be able to tell that there are 529 tigers in Karnataka, 190 tigers in Kerala, and so on. So how do we put those numbers on these bar columns? So to do that, we'll use this function called, called text. So this text function called from the PyPlot module can take any arbitrary text and put it at arbitrary locations on the plot. So we need to tell what to write on the plot and we need to give it the x and y coordinates to place it at a specific position. So how do we find this x and y coordinates for these numbers uh, to be placed in this, in this uh, plot? In case of bar charts, quite conveniently, these bars are situated at uh, integer coordinates along the x-axis. For example, this first bar is placed at x equal to 0, and the second bar is placed at x equal to 1, and so on. We can, we can modify this if you want to, but that's the default behavior, and we'll just rely on that behavior to, to put these numbers at the right place. For example, we want to pick this 529 and put it here, so we'll ask the text function call to place this 529 at x equal to 0, and y equal to 529, which is the height of this bar. And uh, this, this for loop here is doing the same thing for all four numbers in this tiger's list. There are two problems though, uh, which you might have already noticed. These numbers are sticking to the bar columns, and uh, they're not exactly centered on, on this bar. So can we fix that? Um, so let me explain why this is not centered. So we, we have been giving it x and y coordinates to put these numbers at specific uh, places. These numbers are, these this, uh, text snippets are left aligned with respect to that coordinate. So if we can tell it to somehow center align it, that would fix the centering problem. So we'll fix both those problems, the sticking with the bar and the centering problem in this slide. So you're creating more room from between the numbers and the bar columns by adding another five to each uh, y coordinate value. And we're using this keyword argument called HA, which stands for horizontal alignment, equal to center to center them. So when we talk about bars, we can make group bar charts like this, where I'm showing the number of elephants along with the number of tigers. And we can also make stack bar charts like this, where the number of elephants is on top of, the, the bars for elephants are on top of the bars for tigers. Uh, the code is a little bit more verbose, I'll not be describing it right now. It's in the slide and I'll be sharing the slide on Twitter later. So for now, let me move on to the next topic. Um, so this is a personal uh, story. Um, about six years ago, when I was dating my girlfriend, on Valentine's Day, I thought I'd make a Valentine's, a mathematical Valentine. So, <laughs> so these are the two equations. Uh, this is how I'll start. I'll not explain these two equations right now, it'll, it'll take some time. Uh, so I've got a GitHub link there which has more details about the two equations. So let me just start with these two equations. Just take my word for it that if we plot this, it will result in a heart-shaped curve on a two-dimensional Euclidean plane. So in this slide, I'm just taking those two equations and converting it into Python code. Uh, these three lines represent the two equations in the previous slide. So the x value is set to a huge number of um, values between minus 1 and 1. And then I'm computing the y coordinates for each uh, of those x values using the two equations that were present in the previous slide. Uh, you might see the two equations written in LaTeX form uh, once again here. Uh, that's because I want to show a legend like this. And that's one of the nice things about Matplotlib. It supports LaTeX in a, in, in a variety of contexts like title, x labels, y labels, as well as legends. So that's why I have this latex code here, and um, I specify this latex code as the label 
uh, argument here, and then I call the legend function called to show the legend. Uh, you might have noticed a problem here already, that is the legend is at an awkward position at the center of this image when we are usually used to seeing it somewhere at the top right corner. So that's because there's not much room around this heart to put a legend at a good place. Uh, in this particular case, when we call the legend function, it tries to figure out what is the best place to put the legend and it has found uh, this as one of the places. Uh, we'll fix this problem by creating more room around the heart. And to do that, we'll call the xlim and ylim function calls. Uh, so the xlim function, with the xlim function call, I'm increasing the x limits from minus 1.5 to 1.5, and uh, likewise for the y axis limits. Now there is more room around this heart, and as a result, we have the legend at the right place. So when I was uh, doing this uh, six years ago, uh, the, the look and feel that I was going for was the graph paper look and feel. Um, so um, the kind of graph paper that we used to use in our high school days with the green color grid, uh, I hope you get the idea. Uh, to, to get that look and feel, uh, we need to plot a grid on this, on this plot. And to plot a grid, we need to define the major tick locations and the minor tick locations. So we'll do that now. So these five statements define the major tick and minor tick locations. This GCA call, this, is, this means get current axis. This gets the current axis for the plot and then we get hold of its x-axis and y-axis and we start defining the major and minor tick locations. So this first statement, for example, is telling that every multiple of 0.5 on this x-axis is a major tick location. The second line here is saying that every multiple of 0.1 is minor tick location mm -hmm. and likewise for y-axis. So once these tick locations are defined, it's really easy to plot a grid. We only need to call the grid function calls like this, once for major grid lines, once again for minor grid lines, and specifying the color to green, and I'm making sure that the major grid lines are thicker than the minor grid lines. Uh, next, I want to make these tick labels as well as tick lines also green in color. For that, I'll be using the tick underscore params function calls, and once again, I'm calling it uh, twice, once for major uh, tick params, once again for minor tick params, I'm coloring them green. So I've got something like this. Um, the next thing I want to fix is these bounding lines. The, the four bounding line, lines that you see here, they're still black in color. I want to make them as well green. All right, so there's one more thing I want to cover before that. Um, so if you see uh, in this in this tick lines, they're protruding outside the bounding boxes. So that doesn't look very pretty. So I want to get rid of those so that uh, this this plot looks much more cleaner and crisp. So in order to do that, I'm setting the tick length to zero. And that get, gets rid of all this uh, protruding tick lines. Now I'll fix the bounding lines color problem, which is still black. I want them to be green. So these bounding lines are called splines in, in Matplotlib. So we'll get hold of all the four splines using the axis object. And I'm setting them all, all of them to green. And that's how I have got very close to the graph paper look and feel. There's one little problem, and that is the that is these uh, grid boxes. So these grid boxes, each each major grid boxes is 0 0.5 by 0 0.5 in dimension. Although it doesn't look like a exactly like a square, it looks a little bit squished. Uh, that is because of the aspect ratio. So now I'm setting the aspect ratio to equal so that the same scaling is used for plotting both the x code, x axis and y axis units. And now the, the grid boxes are, uh, the grid boxes look like square. As a result, the heart also looks more wholesome now. Finally, we can put um, <laughs> some, we can put some personalized message like this and uh, we use the text function call again. The, we saw the text function calls uh, while uh, putting numbers on top of those bar columns in the bar chart. So it's the same function call. We give it the x and y coordinates and the message we want to put. So of course, when I when I did this for my girlfriend six years back, I put my own personalized message and um, I printed this you know on a good quality paper, laminated it with a lamination sheet and presented it to it to her during the dinner. Uh, she was impressed. She liked what she saw and. Um, 
and, and now we are happily married, so I can <laughs> so I can tell you that this thing uh, worked out pretty well for me. <laughs> All right. So um, let me now move on to a professional story. So this is a line um, chart. It's trying a performance problem in a log parsing engine that I was working on uh, several years ago. This is telling us that it takes one second to process a log file containing 1,000 logs. Uh, three seconds if there are 2,000 logs and uh, close to 500, 520 seconds when there is close to 8,000 logs. So the problem here is that the time, con the time consumed to process this log file is not growing linearly with respect to the number of uh, lines of log. If it were, it would have taken only 8 seconds to process this 8,000 lines of log when it is taking just one second to process 1,000 lines of log. So uh, when I, uh, my responsibility was to run a bunch of experiments, understand the numbers, and um, present it to our management because uh, this was a problem that was affecting our customers. So when I decided to present these numbers, of course I thought I would plot it using Matplotlib like, like this, but then I thought in order to lighten the mood of the conversation, maybe I'll not present it in just this format, but something like this in XKCD style. So, <laughs> So you can see those little wiggles, and um, I, most people in, I see in the technology industry love XKCD, so once you put something like this, it starts its own conversation uh, about your favorite XKCD comic. So it's really easy to plot something uh, using the XKCD style. We just need to make this one single function call here, and once this function call is done, all plotting functions start using the XKCD uh, style plotting mode. This font here is called the Humor Sans font. Um, if it is installed on your system, it will be automatically picked up for any XKCD style plotting. This is recommended by the Matplotlib documentation itself. <laughs> and yeah, so this is the Humor Sans font. This one little trick to be aware of though, once you install the font, you have to remove any Matplotlib cache directory that might be present in your home directory. So I've got the commands here for both macOS and Debian based systems. Uh, that is because only if you remove the cache, it will be forced to rebuild the cache when it runs the next time and rebuild the font list and find this new font that is on your system. There are a couple of ways to customize an XKCD style plot. These are the three keyword arguments it takes, scale, length and randomness. Scale stands for the amplitude of each wiggle. Length is the length of each wiggle and randomness is the randomness in the length of each wiggle. So I'll give you some examples. So scale, my name is the amplitude. So when I increase the scale to 5, the wiggles are a little bit more prominent. I'm not sure whether you're able to see that from back there. If the scale is 0 0.2, which I've reduced the scale, the wiggles are so subtle that they, have, they almost look like straight lines now. This is the wiggle length. If we make the length as, if, so here I've decreased the length. The default was 100. So I've decreased it to 20, so the wiggles are shorter. But if I increase it to something like 500, the wiggles are so long that, that they again look like straight lines. Finally, the randomness. Uh, to make the randomness happen, I increase the scale as well so that you can see the wiggles more prominently. So with the randomness of 1, the wiggles look very regular. This, there doesn't appear to be much randomness. But if we increase the randomness to 10, they are more irregular now compared to the one in the previous one. Yeah, so that was all. That's all I wanted to share with you. Uh, okay, thank you very much to you, Susan. We probably have time for a quick question. One single question. Does anyone have any questions? Down here at the front, please. Uh, yeah. uh, so the problem that uh, uh, I have with the uh, um, you know, pipelines is that uh, the closing libraries in Python in general is that approach that everything happens in the global context. Yes. And like you just mentioned, if you make changes to the style of your one particular plot, it affects all the other plots uh, created after that. So I'm just wondering what's, what's the reason behind it, why uh, 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 all of these developers are taking this uh, apparently strange approach. Is there something that I'm missing? Yes. How is it helpful? Because it seems to be very uh, uh, unhelpful. Yeah, I think the, um, the answer is the heritage of the um, software which is inspired by MATLAB. And MATLAB had taken that approach of picking, uh, of having all the settings in the global context. Although, uh, uh, 
matplotlib gives us uh, final control. For example, the GCA function call or the GC function call, they help us extract only the current figure or the current axis, manipulate them without affecting anything else. And similarly, there's the SC, I think, which is the set current axis and SC of set current figure. So it is possible in matplotlib to make changes to our local context and then give it back to pyplot. Uh, so that is one of the ways to work around that problem. Right. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Another round of applause.